So far we've concentrated on pure substances, pure solids, pure liquids, gases, etc. We're going to move now into talking about how we describe the composition of mixtures, focusing especially on solutions. A solution is defined as a homogeneous mixture of two or more components, and that's it. So nothing about the state of matter in there at all. There are solid solutions, there are solutions of gases and liquids, even gases and gases could be thought of as solutions. Here, we're primarily going to focus on solutions in which the solvent, which is the component in greatest amount in a solution, is a liquid. And this results in a substance overall, a mix, the mixture overall is in liquid form, even if the solute is typically a solid or a gas or in some cases another liquid. Now, the solute, by the way, uh, is a component in a solution in smaller amount than the solvent. And again, that's, that's it. That's a, a very straightforward definition. And so if we're talking a two-component solution, the solute is just the component in that solution in, in smaller amount in the mixture. So what you're seeing on the right-hand side of this slide is a submicroscopic view of a solution of sodium chloride, the ionic compound sodium chloride, in water. Sodium and chloride are the solutes, and the solvent is water, and we can see the water molecules with the red oxygen and white hydrogen atoms throughout this solution. Water solutions, solutions in which water is the solvent, have a special name. They're called aqueous, and you'll see this used throughout this course and throughout your introductory chemistry course more than likely. The vast majority of solutions you'll come across will be aqueous in your introductory chemistry courses. The solutes here are the ions sodium plus and Cl minus, and this is an important point that we'll see again. When ionic compounds dissolve in water, their ions dissociate, and we can think of each of those ions as an individual type of solute. So we could argue, for example, that this sodium chloride solution is actually a three-component solution consisting of water as the solvent, sodium plus solute, and Cl minus solute. We often want to think about with solutions, how much of the solute do I have in a given amount of solution or relative to the amount of solvent I've got? And that's expressed through the concentration. Concentration is defined as the relative amount or density of the solute uh, within a solution. And we can define a concentration for any of the solutes within a solution. So for example, in the sodium chloride solution, we could define a concentration of sodium ions and a concentration of chloride ions, and in this case they would be equal, and we'll talk about how to demonstrate that here in a little bit. So these are really the foundational concepts for thinking about solutions, which are simply homogeneous mixtures of a solute dispersed in a solvent. So now let's dig into the idea of solutions in a little more detail and talk about how we describe them quantitatively, focusing in especially on concentration. The terms dilute and concentrated describe the relative amounts of solute in two or more solutions, where dilute refers to a smaller concentration of solute and concentrated refers to a higher concentration of solute. And you may have heard these terms before. So on the slide, you see two examples of solutions. One is a dilute solution of NiCl2 and the other is a concentrated solution of NiCl2 or nickel-2 chloride. In the dilute solution, we see a lighter color, and we'll come back to explaining that here in a second. And if we zoom in on the molecular level view or the submicroscopic view of this solution, we might see something like this, where I'm, I'm drawing water molecules as kind of implied, and the black dots indicate solute molecules. So solvent not shown, solute is there. The concentrated solution has a higher concentration of nickel-2 chloride in it, so more solute molecules for a given volume, for example, or a given mass of solution. And if we zoom in on that solution and look at the submicroscopic picture, we would see more solute molecules in a given amount of solution, a given volume, given mass, etc. So the concentrated solution has a higher density of solute molecules, or in this case ions, in a given space. Now, what about the color difference? Well, the color difference here comes from the difference in concentration via a principle called the Beer-Lambert Law, which says essentially that the amount of light absorbed by a solution is linearly proportional or linearly related to the concentration of a light-absorbing solute in that solution. So the light-absorbing solute in the solution is the nickel-2 plus cation, and the higher the concentration of that solute, the deeper is the color of the solution. 
Mathematically, we represent this using an equation A equals epsilon times L times C, where A is this absorbance value. It's a measure of how much light is absorbed by the solution. C is the concentration of the light absorbing component in that solution. And the L is the path length of light through the solution. And so here we're looking at two equivalent beakers. So L is the same in both cases. L is very commonly, if you're doing an experiment, for example, with a spectrometer, one centimeter, which is the, the path length of light through the vessel that holds the solution when you're doing spectrometry in many cases. So, or spectroscopy rather. Epsilon, by the way, is just the proportionality constant between L times C and the absorbance. Now that we've defined concentration, let's talk about some concentration units. And by far the most important unit of concentration for chemistry is called molarity. Molarity is defined as the moles of a solute per liter of solution. And the, those words following of are very important here. Moles of solute for every liter of solution is the definition of molarity. And as we've seen previously, we can define a molarity for all of the various solutes within a solution, including each distinct ion within a solution of an ionic compound. And unless you see otherwise, we're gonna assume here that the solvent is water. In other words, that we're dealing with aqueous solutions. So to get a little more familiar with molarity and, and dig into this definition in a little more detail, let's look at this example problem on the slide. Ionic compounds dissociate into their component ions when dissolved in water. We've seen this previously. What are the molarities of nickel 2 plus and Cl minus in a 1.5 molar solution of NiCl2? And this 2, by the way, should be superscripted so that this is nickel 2 plus, not two nickel ions, but nick one nickel ion with a charge of 2 plus. So the key information here is that the solution is 1.5 molar, and the capital M is really just shorthand for the moles per liter units. Let's start as we always do and draw a picture of the situation. This is an aqueous solution, so it's gonna look like water. It's gonna look like a liquid, and it's gonna be green because the nickel two plus cation is green, although that's not essential information to the problem. To keep things mathematically simple, let's assume that we're dealing with one liter of solution. And we're gonna to need to do this because we're gonna be thinking about the numbers of moles of nickel two plus and Cl minus in this solution. So assuming one liter helps us very easily convert quote unquote from molarity to moles. Because the molarity is 1.5 moles for every liter of solution, we can conclude after assuming that we have one liter of solution that that solution contains 1.5 moles of nickel two chloride within it, 1.5 moles of NiCl2. And at this point, we can think about that NiCl2 dissociating into its component ions and what the balanced chemical equation for that would look like. In every molecule or every mole of NiCl2, we have one mole of nickel 2 plus and two moles of chloride. Notice the two subscript on Cl in this compound. And so to determine the molarities of nickel 2 plus and, and Cl minus in the solution, we actually need to take this into account, especially the fact that two Cl minuses are generated from every one nickel 2 chloride unit that dissolves. So we have 1.5 moles of NiCl2 in the solution. After dissociation, how many moles of nickel 2 plus and Cl minus do we have? Well, based on the equation on the right over here, this chemical equation, we can conclude that we have, first of all, 1.5 moles of nickel 2 plus in that solution. There's a one to one ratio of NiCl2 to nickel two plus here. We can also conclude that we have three moles of Cl minus in this solution. And that's because we started with 1.5 moles of NiCl2, dissociation generated two Cl minuses for every NiCl2 unit that dissociated. And so twice the moles of Ni NiCl2 is equal to the moles of Cl minus here. Now, to get these back into concentrations, we divide by the volume of the solution that we assumed at the outset, which is the one liter of solution. When we do that in the left-hand case, we get 1.5 mole per liter of nickel two plus and three moles per liter of Cl minus in the right-hand case.
and here we, this should really say Cl minus here rather than Cl since we're talking about the chloride anion. So this gives us a sense of molarity and how to think about molarity type of problems. You can do a lot of these calculations without thinking in terms of moles, quite honestly, but I like starting out thinking in terms of moles because it, it helps us better understand what we're looking at in terms of the picture. And it reminds us of the definition of molarity as a number of moles of solute per liter of solution. It's very common in chemistry that we start with a solution that has a very high concentration of solutes in it. These solutions are convenient to store and use at a variety of lower concentrations. And the reason we can conveniently use them at lower concentrations is that to lower the concentration, all we have to do is add solvent. And that process is called dilution. Dilution is the addition of solvent to a solution. It's that simple. This causes a decrease in concentration of all the solutes. Since we're not messing with the number of moles of any of the solutes, we're just, in essence, changing the volume of the solution by adding more solvent. An example of a dilution process is shown in this figure. We start with a solution called the stock, which is relatively concentrated, and it has a volume that we're going to call V1 and a molarity of the solute that we're going to call M1. To dilute, we simply add water. Let's imagine this is an aqueous solution, so the solvent is water. We add water until the volume is V2, and V2 is larger than V1 since we added water and we arrive at a new molarity of solute M2. So some things to notice here. The concentration has decreased, and we can actually tell that based on the depth of color, right? This is a lighter solution. The diluted solution is lighter than the concentrated stock solution that we started with. The volume of the solution has increased, and importantly, based on the definition of dilution, the moles of solute, whatever it may be, this blue solute, have not changed. Because the moles of solute are constant during dilution, we can set up an equation where we equate those two numbers of moles and then express them as the product of the molarity times the volume. And so M1V1, on the left-hand side of this equation, is simply the number of moles of the blue solute in the stock solution, right? That molarity is moles per liter times liters gives us moles of the blue solute. M2V2 is the number of moles of blue solute in the diluted solution, moles per liter times liters in the case of the diluted solution. And those two must be equal based on the definition of dilution. This is called the dilution equation, and it's extremely useful for planning dilution processes. If we want to hit a target concentration of diluted solution, for example, or figure out how much stock do I need to use in order to hit some target concentration and or some target volume, this equation is going to be our primary tool in order to answer problems of this type. And in fact, this doesn't have to use molarity, which is pretty cool. The dilution equation generalizes to any concentration units, and the volumes don't even need to correspond with the units of concentration. So you can, for example, combine molarity, which is moles per liter, with milliliters, or molarity with cubic inches as a volume measure. The key thing in order for the dilution equation to work is that the units have to match on both sides of the equation. So the, the concentration units, C1 and C2, must be the same, and the units of V1 and V2, the volumes, must match each other as well. As long as that condition is met, you can use the dilution equation with, which, uh, with almost any units that you, you choose, whichever units are most convenient for solving the problem. Let's work through an example problem involving dilution. Let's imagine we started with a 5.0 molar solution of copper 2 nitrate, CuNO32. And we started with 850 milliliters or 0 0.850 liters of that solution. And we diluted it to a volume of 1.8 liters. The question here is, what's the concentration of the diluted solution? We know the initial and final volumes and the initial concentration. What is the final concentration after the dilution process? Let's start by drawing a picture. And the picture actually is going to look very similar to the picture on the previous slide that showed the stock and diluted solution. So we start with the stock solution. We add solvent to that to increase the volume without changing the number of moles of solute. And here I was actually very careful to draw 12 dots of solute, both in the stock and diluted solution. So you can see there's a spreading out of the solute particles in the diluted solution. Now, 
let's express what we know in terms of a quantity that remains constant in this situation. The moles of solute, the moles of copper to nitrate, remain constant. And we can calculate that number of moles in the case of the stock solution by taking our molarity, which is given 5 moles per liter, and multiplying by the volume, 0.850 liters. The product of those two is the moles of copper to nitrate, and that's some number that we actually don't need for the time being. We know in the diluted solution, though, that the number of moles of copper to nitrate must be equal to that number. And so the product of the volume of the diluted solution, 1.80 liters, times the molarity of that diluted solution, which we don't know, we're trying to find out, so I've labeled it M2, must be equal to the product corresponding to the stock solution. So this equality enables us to set up an equation, and we can solve that equation for M2. And so the equation is 0.85 liters times 5 moles per liter in the stock solution is equal to the volume of the diluted solution times M2. And when we solve for M2, we get that the concentration of copper 2 nitrate in the diluted solution is 2.36 moles per liter. Does this make sense? Well, as a quick sanity check, this number is lower than the 5 moles per liter that we started with, and that should make sense since the dilution was undertaken. We increased the volume of the solution and didn't mess with the moles of copper 2 nitrate. Very commonly, we make use of the dilution equation to plan a dilution to hit a target concentration and volume in the diluted solution. And we've got a stock solution whose concentration we know, but what we don't know is how much of that stock solution in terms of volume we need to use to hit our target concentration and volume of the diluted solution. And that's the situation in this example problem. The question is, what volume of stock 1.59 mole per liter KOH solution is required to prepare a diluted solution with a total volume of 5 liters and a concentration of 0.1 mole per liter KOH? Let's draw a picture of the situation. So we're starting with the stock solution, actually whose volume we don't know, which is why I've indicated this dotted line here. We're not sure about the volume. What we are sure of is that we're going to add solute, add water to that solution to give a diluted solution that is 5 liters of total volume at a concentration of 0.1 mole per liter KOH. We also know that the moles of KOH does not change during this process. And so the product of the molarity and volume in the stock and diluted solutions must be equal. That product in the case of the stock is the 1.59 mole per liter KOH times this volume that we don't know that we're trying to figure out, which I've called V1, since the stock solution volume before the dilution process. We know actually everything we need to know about the diluted solution. We want 5 liters at a concentration of 0.100 moles per liter, and that product must be equal to this product. And this equality enables us to set up an equation as we did before, where now the unknown is V1, and solving for V1 is very simple. Just divide both sides by 1.59 mole per liter, and this gets us to 0.314 liters for V1. And so what we can say now is that in order to prepare this 5 liters of 0.1 molar KOH solution, how do we do it? Well, we start with 0.314 liters, or 314 milliliters, of this stock KOH solution that we've got, which has a concentration of 1.59 molar. We then add enough solvent, enough water, to increase the solution volume to a total of 5 liters. And once we've done that, we've hit our target concentration of 0.1 mole per liter KOH.